the risk and transformative, transformative adaptation. Uh, yes, no, it's in... Oh, there. The one that's <coughs> this one? Yeah. And this in your pocket, please. Okay. And is it possible to get presented view on there? Or? Sorry, just, just while we're setting up the, the, the presentation, I would just like to extend uh, sincere apologies from my colleague, Adi, Aditi uh, Mukherjee, who unfortunately can't join us today. While we're getting this set up, I just want to reflect one last bit on that previous no. talk. Um, you know, in the context of this workshop, you know, we are going to be talking about many, many forms of uncertainty uh, from the global pathways, the global scenarios into the climate models, the way we downscale the observational data sets that we blend for bias adjustment. Uh, we haven't even gotten into impacts modeling and things like that yet. Uh, but it's worth kind of tracking all of these things. And from the bottom line perspective, we are here to talk about impacts and management of risk. So at some level, all of those uncertainties, all of those distributions, if we can cross that with our own systems responses and figure out what is our actual management space, what is the risk that we are looking to manage, when, we look, when you go across all of those different sources of uncertainty, you end up with a certain risk of, of a danger threshold being exceeded or a certain loss being achieved. Um, so in the end, we, we have to ask ourselves, it's nothing that we can, we can say from, from the front of the room, uh, but what is the level of risk that you're able to manage? And how does that cross statistically and on kind of raw, raw values of you know, exceedance thresholds and things like that? Uh, okay, I think we got it set up. Uh, yeah, uh, apologies for that. So. Uh, my name is Alvira Polchanska. I'm the science advisor to the working group two co-chairs and TSU. Um, the presentation I'm going to give today will give a, an overview of some of the, the aspects that, TS, that working group two, which focuses on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability, assesses in their report. Um, we've had a very good um, presentation from my working group one colleagues to start with. So... And uh, you can see that the type of interaction that's already happening um, across the different working groups. And I'd just like to say that even though I'm giving this presentation, this is very much drawn on the entire working group to author team. So I thank them all. And we actually have Harushka with us in the audience today who will um, assist us with any questions. So you've heard a lot. So you heard in the first this morning about the the processes for IPCC. So I won't go over those again, but I'll just reiterate that there's a number of reports that have been produced during the six assessment cycle. Um, if you haven't actually looked at any of these, they're all online. You can go to the IPCC website. I've put the address there. 
You can download chapters. You can actually download figures if you, if you need to use the figures. And there's also additional resources, such as uh, fact sheets, um, et cetera, that's available for you there. And just, just to set the, the context, the, the main, one of the key messages coming out the Working Group 2 report, and that was also taken through to the synthesis report, is that the pace and scale of action so far and current plans are insufficient to, to tackle climate change. And I think Yuri's talk just before also um, highlighted this aspect. And the reason why we're here today is because providing robust evidence of climate change, of its adverse impacts and risks, and as well as assessment of adaptation mitigation options is actually, actually key for policy and decision makers. And this is particularly true at regional or system scales where often we might have uh, information or data that's lacking. Uh, the, the other key... Uh, message that came out of the Working Group 2 assessment that was in contrast to the previous assessment reports is that the, the Working Group 2 really strongly recognised this interdependence between climate, between ecosystems and biodiversity, and between human societies. Um, these interactions, they're the basis for emerging risks from climate change and also interact with other non-climatic challenges. Um, there's a current imbalance as well at the moment, so timely action is needed for a sustainable future. And we can no longer think in silos, but have to look across climate, biodiversity, human society and well-being, well-being to tackle the global challenges we face today. And the risk concept, which you can see in the middle of... Um, aha, this does work. You can see in the middle of this circle here, is actual central to, under, to, to the assessments. So just going to start with um, impacts. So, so my working group one colleagues have actually been through some of the methodologies that they use for, for attribution. Um, you can find this figure in the cross working group box on attribution. So that's in chapter one in working group two, but it's also uh, in the working group one uh, report, assessment report. I'm not quite sure what chapter. Um, and just want to highlight that for that when we talk to impact uh, attribution, this at the moment this is not always to anthropogenic climate change, but to climate change uh, in in general. So that's a, a sort of knowledge gap that needs to be addressed. Um, and there are quantitative and qualitative approaches. So so for impact assessment as well as the statistical approaches, bringing together. Um, uh, sort of large-scale meta-analyses, and bringing together multiple lines of evidence. So bringing together qualitative information, information from experimental data, from conceptual understanding, um, to, 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 clarify, uh, to, to strengthen attribution. And in order to do this, it's really critical to, to ensure appropriate framing. So, so to develop um, in stage three the sort of hypotheses and possible causes. So, so bringing in understanding of other potential drivers um, of the change. Um, for IPCC, you've heard that we, we really rely on published data. So please try and, try and publish and, and make your studies available. And uh, also as well, sort of transparency in data. So, so again, making uh, data available. So, so this is the uh, uh, this is from the working group two summary for policymakers, and the key message around this figure is that the impacts of climate change is growing and accumulating at global, continental, and other regional scales, but there are gaps in knowledge. So, so the 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 assessment here um, looks at I've just. Just pick part of this. Oops, part of this figure to show you. But the assessment here looks at water scarcity and food production, impacts on health and well-being, and impacts on city settlements and infrastructure at the end. And you can see the actual um, challenges that, that were looked at underneath each of these headings. Um, so the assessment drew on the published literature and and looked at the impacts um, for for these 
for these variables for different regions, so the continental regions here, but also for some other regionalizations at the bottom, for example, for mountain regions um, or for the Arctic. Um, and and the, uh, through, through an a assessment process, so you, you heard earlier this morning about assessing the literature and looking at the sort of confidence within the literature. Um, the authors produced this impact assessment, and you can see that overwhelmingly, most of the uh, impacts are actually increasing adverse impacts although there are cases where actually some increasing adverse and positive impacts are noted um, within a region. But there are still data gaps. So, for example, if we look at animal and livestock health and productivity, at the global scale, and these, these global um, assessment is very much based on large-scale studies, on meta-analyses, etc., that, that this, this level of research is still uh, missing here. But if we look at the regional scales, you can see that, that there is, um, in some places, a, there's sort of medium um, uh, to high confidence um, of impacts. So we've, we heard this morning that every small increase in warming will result in increased risks. And uh, the Working Group 2 assessment outlined um, some of those risks. So the exposure of populations to heat waves will continue to increase with additional warming. Um, at approximately uh, uh, two, uh, two, 2 Celsius, regions relying on snow melt could experience declines in water. Um, we know that climate change will undermine food security. At two degrees Celsius by 2050, people in sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Central and South America, and small islands are likely to experience food shortages leading to malnutrition. And there's risks for the billions of the billion people living in low-lying cities and other settlements on the, on the coast. So here, this, this gives you a sort of global overview. But if you have a look within Working Group 2 report, we have very extensive regional focus. Um, including in the regional chapters and the, the regional cross-chapter papers. Um, in addition, the, the report highlights the risks coming from simultaneous um, extreme events that can compound risks. So when multiple events happen at the same time, they compound overall risk and they're more difficult to manage. And this, this figure here shows an example of how heat and drought combine to cause um, reductions in crop yields, um, made worse by reduced productivity because workers are suffering from heat stress, and the reduced yields leads to reductions in household incomes, increased food prices locally, and potentially at a global scale. So climate risks do not respect national boundaries, and weather-related extremes are creating shocks to global trade. So coming back to our risk concept. So this is a risk concept from the fifth assessment report that was also used by, um, to some degree by working group two in the sixth assessment report. And it shows that risk is determined by interactions between hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. And uh, the arrows that you can see here, oops, that one. The arrows you can see here Show, represent actions to reduce either the hazard, vulnerability, or exposure, and there, thereby uh, impact the level of risk or uh, realise risk, which in this case is um, uh, impacts. So in AR6, we actually advance the risk concept somewhat, somewhat as well. Um, so, so this... this uh, this figure here can be found in our chapter one and also in the synthesis report, and that the nature of climate risk also involves risks from the responses themselves. Um, so, so when I say risks from responses themselves, so you can see here that we now have this fourth propeller that's been added to the risk concept, 
And uh, this includes the possibility of, of, of responses, so adaptation and mitigation responses, not achieving their intended objectives, having trade-offs, having adverse side effects for other societal objectives, maybe generating novel hazards or unexpected side effects. Um, and the, the nature of risk also includes residual impacts that will occur even with ambitious um, actions given limits to adaptation. So, so, um, so risk itself depends on a combination of many factors, um, but to communicate risk, um, we also use this um, visualization that shows the um, relationship between warming levels and risk. And we call this the burning embers diagram. So, so on the left here, you can see a burning ember. And you can see it's called that because it has different colors going up the side. And the, the, these are plotted against temperature, as you'll see in the following um, slides. Uh, sorry, not temperature, global warming level. Um, and each of the, the colors um, responds to the level of added risk um, assessed under climate change. So, so we go from undetectable, which is the white, so the impacts and risks are, are undetectable, up to very high, where there's very uh, in the purple here. And the assessment looks at the, the, the level, the global warming level over which risk transitions between these um, different categories, and there's, there, you will see that there's confidence levels um, assigned to the risk. There is a, a, a process to put the burning embers together that's based on an assessment of the, of the knowledge that's in the literature. It also brings in an expert elicitation process, um, and then uh, visualizing the, the outcomes of it all. And on Thursday morning, I believe you're going to have a, a session about visualizing risk through burning embers. So the Working Group 2 report uh, showed that risks are increasing with every increment of global warming. This is actually the, the figure that went through to the synthesis report, and that risks differ by system. So on the left here, we have land-based systems. On the right, we have ocean-based systems. And each of these embers has a narrative behind it, and a narrative that describes how the risk changes with the global warming level. And you can see, if we look at the first one here, um, on the risk of wildfire damage, you can see that, that the, you know, around uh, one degrees, there's an increase in the length of fire, the, the fire season. And as we get into the higher levels, the, the number of additional people that are exposed greatly increases. On the right-hand side, for, coral, for the warm water corals, so based on the the, the best available um, knowledge and scientific evidence. We can see that around 1.5 coral reefs are expected to decline by a further 70 to 90%. And actually at two degrees, that decline is um, expected to be more than 99%. What was new in AR6 was we also carried out burning embers at regional levels so I've just and sectoral levels so I've just got I've just shown you a selection of them here but you can find these um, in the the summary for policymakers and also throughout the sectoral and regional chapters um, so I've given you three examples here from Africa the Mediterranean and Europe um, and you can see that 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 the burning ember risk assessment was done for a, a variety. So, crop, so the, the risk of, to food production from crops, fisheries, and livestock in Africa, biodiversity and ecosystems in Africa, and the delayed uh, impacts of sea level rise in the Mediterranean. Unfortunately, we weren't able to produce burning embers for all of the regional chapters. and. Uh, and sectors, and this is very much due to um, a lack of uh, literature at the moment, but there are key risks um, identified for each of them. So although we didn't have burning embers for the, the small islands, at the same time, there is, you, you can see the assessment of the, the key risks for um, the small island region um, 
which includes um, economic decline and livelihood failure from fisheries, agriculture, tourism and biodiversity loss. Um, so as so as well as as well as producing visualizations of risk, uh, we the the working group two um, report also included um, projections of impacts, and you can find many of these in the working group two atlas. So here I'm showing risk of species loss. So this is examples of impacts without additional adaptation. Um, and we'll come back to this. There's a session on Wednesday about biodiversity, so we'll come back to, to some of these issues then. So coming on to adaptation, there are options that we can take to reduce risks to people and nature. That was certainly highlighted in the Working Group 2 report. And this is taken from the uh, special report on ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate. So this uses the, the, the three propeller um, risk concept, and you can see for each of these uh, propellers here, there's actions to reduce hazards, to reduce vulnerability, and to reduce exposure. This is actually, oh, I see that, that is, this is actually for climate risk at the coasts. I can see that's a bit covered there. Um, but you can see that there's examples of, of actions that can be taken to reduce hazards, vulnerability, and exposure, and thereby uh, impact risk. Um, but at the same time, there's acknowledgement of limits to adaptation, whether they be ecological or technologi technological um, or other limits to adaptation. Uh, this is another example that originated also in the special report on oceans and cryosphere, but, you could, but is also in the synthesis report and the summary for policymakers. And this is risk to coastal geographies with sea level rise. And what's, what's new here is that, these, that, that, e that for each of these geographies, so there's four geographies at the bottom here, that the burning ember risk assessment was done with moderate, uh, no or moderate um, adaptation responses, and then with the maximum potential um, response. Um, and in order to put this, uh, in order to put this together, this was based on a limited number of real-world case studies, where there was where where they were actually well covered by the peer-reviewed literature. So, as an example, for Arctic communities, it was the, these um, these embers are based on studies from five Arctic communities, where there is. Um, considerable information available um, in the peer-reviewed literature. And the hazards that were considered here include flooding, erosion, and salinization. Um, and exposure and vulnerability um, was assessed by, for example, density of assets on the coast um, or de density of uh, uh, people on the coast. So this gives an example of how risk um, of how risk can be, produce, can be reduced um, through adaptation. But there are limits to adaptation. So the Working Group 2 report stresses that even effective adaptation cannot prevent all losses and damages. Above 1.5 degrees, some natural solutions may no longer work. We've already, um, earlier in, in the, the presentation, I talked about the, the challenges for freshwater supply on islands and mountains, through severe infrastructure damage, unavoidable sea, sea level rise, and also the risk of irreversible changes, for example, species extinctions. Once a species is gone, that species is, is definitely gone. Um, but the Working Group 2 report also looks at ways to accelerate um, adaptation. So, so how do we accelerate and sustain adaptation? So political commitment and follow through. Um, but critically, enhancing knowledge of impacts and risks and adaptation feasibility and effectiveness improves responses and monitoring and evaluation of adaptation measures. And I believe during the week, there's going to be some sessions focused on sort of some of the, the sectoral challenges um, 
where, where you'll discuss impacts and um, adaptation. And finally, we have uh, incremental adaptation versus transformational adaptation. So incremental, incremental adaptation being that that maintains the, the essence and or integrity of, of a process. So, um, so, so small changes, um, uh, so, so sort of changes that result in um, smaller steps. And sometimes incremental adaptation can accrue to result in transformational adaptation. But transformational adaptation, given urgency, is the adaptation that changes fundamental attributes. Um, again, this, this is a sort of emerging um, knowledge base. But in our working group 16, um, we have a table here that looks at the different dimensions of adaptation and the transformative potential of that adaptation. So, for example, low trans so if we look at speed, low transformative potential when adaptation is implemented slowly, um, but high when change is considered rapid for the, for the given context. And um, I'd just like to follow up with also the concept of climate resilient development. This brings together um, reduced climate risks through adaptation, reduced greenhouse gases through mitigation, enhanced biodiversity, and um, achieving the, the sustainable development goals. And you can see on the right here that we have two, two, two sets of worlds, a, a sort of um, a, a preferred world and a, a non-preferred world. And um, the, the actions that are needed to achieve those. And this is what we call climate resilient development. And this is the figure from, from the synthesis report, but shows a different, but this is conceptually shows the climate resilient development pathways. It considers conditions that enable, conditions that constrain, um, and the, 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 the uh, the out and the outcomes from those pathways, and the challenge now is is to consider how to how to shift um, action um, to the more to the to the the higher level pathways, and uh, at the moment this is very conceptual. So how to quantify um, uh, some some of this knowledge, and just looking to AR seven. So this is just. Uh, this is just speculation uh, from myself, but, but certainly sort of more integrating um, knowledge from different, different methodologies, so uh, reinforcing the um, collaborations, the, 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 the cross-working group collaborations, and bringing in social sciences, humanities, and uh, uh, views from businesses. Um, Consistent, uh, consistent scenario-based impact and risk analysis across scales, understanding where the, high, the hard limits are, compounding risks, climate feedbacks, understanding of enablers and barriers and effectiveness for adaptation, and how to move from incremental to transformational adaptation. And throughout all of this, to consider uh, equity and justice. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Elvira. Question? 